Oh, hey, Team Fortress 2 is 10 years old. Or was 10 years old. It's still 10 years old. Man, I haven't played TF2 in a while. Let's go. I gotta get back into that, man. Yeah, this is... Mm. Yeah, this is... Uh... Okay. I don't know. This Is this Team Fortress 2? Let's, let's turn the clock back on this one. So, let's talk about Team Fortress 2. A decade late. We've got to start at the most logical place, the beginning. Orange Box's launch. Alongside Half-Life 2 and its episodes, and Portal, we got this little online bonus game by the name of Team Fortress 2. Based on the Sierra Online game, released on April 7th, uh, 420. Uh, 1996 as a mod for Quake, and in 99 as a mod for Half-Life, Team Fortress pits two teams consisting of various numbers and nine different classes. The Scout, the Sniper, Soldier, Demolitions Man, Medic, Heavy Weapons, God, Pyro, Spy, and Engineer, fighting to gain control of capture points, escort civilians, capture flags, etc. Team Fortress 2 kept these same nine mad lads, but gave them a massive facelift and redid the style, changing the original gritty Half-Life Eskar into an aesthetic much more like the art of Brad Bird's The Incredibles or the paintings of Norman Rockwell. But with this overhaul in art and design came a price. Valve spent nine years working on Team Fortress 2 in one way or another, and the end result was a game with such tightly defined character design, people are still praising it. Each character has a unique silhouette that makes them easy to read at a distance. Each team's color scheme is made up of a handful of reds or blues that are incredibly easy to pick apart even for the colorblind due to the differences in luminosity and brightness. The team's team color is primarily centered around their torso, which is where they hold their weapon. And the contrast to the light-colored shirt with the dark chain gun or rocket launcher or shotgun makes it easy to tell what weapon they're holding so you can immediately begin to decipher how you would square off against this guy the moment you face him. And with that, the tightly regimented combat system kicks in. Not only is TF2 fast and visceral, direct mouse input, and emphasis on hitscan weaponry, but the weapons, the health, and the core mechanics of combat are balanced in such a way that each class can equally overpower each other more or less. A heavy can win against a scout by gunning him down as he charges towards him. But a scout can flank the heavy and get a couple good point blank shots in with the scatter gun. A pyro can defeat a spy by burning him while he's cloaked. A spy can kill a pyro by stabbing him before he ever notices. A medic... Medic's really the only outlier here, but being the one character who can directly give others a boost, that's to be expected. TF2 didn't have bonus weapons, it didn't have hats, it was just you, nine men, their team is similar but different nine men, and a dream. 2008 saw the addition of the Gold Rush update, which on top of adding payload as a game mode, gave the medic new unlockable weapons. Just the medic at first. I mean, this was a time when he was the least played class in the game, and he served a huge role, so he needed a hand. The medic received the Bloodsauger, the Ubersaw, and the Kritzkrieg, turning critical hits from a random chance thing into something you'd have ready to go to absolutely overwhelm the enemy team whenever you need it, which was perfect for payload because it let you clear the cart or clear a path for the cart with the help of a medic. Medic became the third most played class in the game following that, no joke. And what followed in 2008 was the Pyro receiving the Backburner, Extinguisher, and Flare Gun, as well as giving the Pyro their now signature Air Blast ability to push enemies and extinguish teammates. Two community maps weaseled their way in. This was followed by the heavy update, including Arena Mode, as well as Natasha, Sandovich, and the Killing Gloves of Boxing. And all throughout 2009, the remaining five classes got updates and... Oh, wait, I meant six, but uh... Oh, wait. Engineer got his update seven months after the Soldier and Demo Man one. Ah, uh, well, I mean that's fine, I guess. It's not like everyone else got a brand new set of weapons two months later. Oh, the Manco store began to change the face of Team Fortress 2. Not only were 65 new items added to the game, including over a dozen hats, but five new weapon sets for Scout, Soldier, Pyro, Sniper, and Spy were included as well. A number of which were already good engineer counters, but then they got a whole lot better with new toys at their disposal. By this point, every class had a few unique weapon options, so the lines in the meta were becoming a bit harder to define. This is where item bans came in for competitive play. They figured some weapons were just too good or too unbalanced for 6 versus 6 play, which is what they had decided on as it was more tightly regimented than 9 versus 9 like Valve wanted. So, certain weapons got banned or blacklisted, or you couldn't use them. I mean, sure, you might be a good engineer, but there's not much you can do to stop a Your Eternal Reward Dead Ringer spy who can cloak when you try to spy check him, or kill you and immediately sap your things if you don't. You might be a good pyro, but now the sniper's got Gerardi and Scout has Mad Milk, both of which can extinguish enemies when first aid kits, dispensers, or bodies of water are scarce. Heavy might have been sluggish in the past, but the gloves of running urgently turn him into a speedy little tank, all things considered, capable of pushing ahead as fast as an engineer or pyro, and blasting in the face of the shotgun or mowing you down with his brass beast. 
2010 was a huge year for Team Fortress 2, but it started becoming clear that the game was losing its luster. People just weren't excited for Team Fortress 2. So what did Valve do? Valve punched all $20 off a of Team Fortress 2 sale price, dropping the game down to the low, low price of absolutely nothing on June 23rd, 2011, all thanks to the revenue pulled from the Manco store and sales on Steam. Again, Valve owns Steam. At the time, I'd been playing Team Fortress 2 for about two and a half weeks, and while in the moment I felt cheated at the game I had bought the orange box for because my compact laptop couldn't run Half-Life or Portal, I revered the hat Valve had sent my way following the event. The Proof of Purchase. At the time, and maybe up until 2013, I had believed that Proof of Purchase was only available to people who had the game prior to the Uber update. But as I would soon learn, I was mistaken. The player base exploded overnight, jumping from between 15 and 25,000 up to over 100,000 players overnight. Everywhere you turned, Team Fortress 2 was big again, bigger than ever. The little Gary's Mod videos got people interested, exploded in popularity, and people were making jokes and parodies of it again. The community was aflame with new talent, and from this point on, it became clear nobody could ever top Team Fortress 2. Several people tried, several people failed. Battlefield Heroes was the first of these to try to assert Valve's Team for Defense Fort 2, launching in 2009 for free with the lighthearted visual style, but an overly slow, grindy process for new content, and in 2013, the game flatlined. Super Monday Night Combat, a colorful hero shooter by Uber Entertainment, failed to hit the marks Team Fortress 2 was creating, lacking skill-ranked matchmaking, your player-owned servers, and an undocumented Bitcoin miner kinda killed the game's hopes soon thereafter. Uh, here's just a pro tip, pause the video, uh, don't use your game for mining bitcoins on other people's uh, computers, they're not gonna like that. This has been a public service announcement. Loadout, a game I loved dearly in 2013 and 2014 for its weapon customization and art style, was left to bleed out when the PS4 version launched, with the entire PC development team unceremoniously fired and development ceasing from that moment. And in 2015, all these games had died, and the idea of a Team Fortress killer seemed implausible, laughable. Uh, a bit daunting. I mean, the game would need to be huge, from a well-established development studio backed by tons of financial investors and hit the ground running with a ridiculous amount of prestige. What developers could possibly be able to pull the blizzard? On November 7th, 2014, Blizzard revealed the first trailer for their new first-person shooter, Overwatch. Based heavily on the likes of Monday Night Combat, League of Legends, and of course, Team's Defense Fort 2, 2, Overwatch blended a colorful, well-lit, clean art style with the twitch reflexes and limited but versatile move pool of a fighting game, or a MOBA. Overwatch's open beta from May 5th to May 10th, 2016, raked in nearly 10 million players, and actually caused a noticeable dent in TF2's player base, as everyone rushed to download the Battle.net client and pick a hero. Meanwhile, Team Fortress 2 was in a rather tumultuous time. Valve didn't know what they wanted out of their Sandy War-themed hat simulator, as it just wasn't pulling the numbers Dota 2 or Counter-Strike Global Offensive. 2015 saw two major content releases and two community updates, but neither update added any weapons. The last gun TF2 had gotten was added in 2014 for the Love and War update, and Gunmetal added in weapon skins and picking up dropped guns not unlike Counter-Strike to make the game appealing to Counter-Strike's steadfast fanbase. This was the time in Team Fortress 2's life that all hands should have been on deck. TF2 now has serious competition looming on the horizon. It's a real threat to the game's livelihood. But Valve, amidst a massive restructuring to focus on improving Steam and investing into the HTC Vive, had all but canned TF2's development team, who'd been moved around to either Dota, CSGO, The Vive, SteamOS, or some unfortunate Left 4 Dead or Half-Life project that would ultimately go nowhere. But for all the polish, all the unique characters and settings and ideas that Overwatch had, it just could not compare to Team Fortress 2 in one regard. It's community. Aside from fan art and videos, the outpouring of custom content for TF2 was insane. Not only has TF2 gotten tons of community-oriented cosmetic updates, including literal hundreds of wearables made by fans, but tons of now-official maps from Turbine to Snakewater got their start in community servers. Even past that, there's thousands of unofficial community maps and game modes that are loved to revere dearly. Versus Saxton Hale is a game mode that lets a team of 31 players fight a single boss with insane health and damage but lacking range options. Death Run pits a team of platformers against a team of trap setters. Rocket jump training, slope surfing, hat trading. The community had found a way to turn Team Fortress 2 into a veritable game development platform with the game's simple rules and the flexibility of the Source SDK. 
Community maps, for better or for worse, were what kept Team Fortress 2 alive so long for so many people. On July 7th, 2016, two months after Overwatch's launch, TF2 got a redesign to include a proper matchmaking option reminiscent of what Overwatch had. TF2 had had a competitive circuit since at least 2009, but Valve spent seven years waiting to capitalize on it and the competitive mode was meant to do just that, adopting the now standard 6v6 mode professional TF2 was based around. But it didn't include many of its finer rules. The in-game competitive circuit had no weapon bans or class limits, which had been staples of the regimented community circuit to keep games on track for so, so long. And Overwatch seemed built around those types of rules as 20-something heroes didn't have unlockable weapons or even unlockable abilities. And shortly after launch, a hero limit of just one per team was allowed, turning the previous version into an arcade mode modifier for the sake of fun. The lack of regulation in TF2's competitive mode killed what hope it had, and as of late, player counts have been... Scarce. Perhaps more damning than the competitive matchmaking was the death of drop-in, drop-out gameplay in Team Fortress 2. The community server browser still exists, sure, but the new matchmaking service lets you pick what map you want and find a Valve official server running it. The previous iteration, Quick Play, lets you pick not just Valve servers, but community servers, and ask for servers with random critical hits disabled, more than 24 players, or other additions to custom fit how you wanted to play Team Fortress 2. The only downside being the lack of selecting the map you wanted, but in those cases you could just go to the server browser and type in CP whatever, or CTF whatever. You just type in the name of the map you wanted to play, and it was there. The server browser is hidden away next to training and opening your network port for private matches if your internet even allows you to do that one. And since 2016, player counts on a ton of community servers have fallen dramatically. There's still over 2,000 community servers running for the game, sure, but a lot of servers have fallen away, gone to the ether, and if they were part of a group with their own dedicated maps, then those maps are pretty much gone. I just found out that in the August of 2017, the Crit Sandwich Trade Bazaar server, the very first server in TF2 I ever played, shut down alongside the rest of the group. Someone worked hard on that map. Tons of people worked hard on these dedicated group maps and they're all just... gone. Over the last several years as well, Team Fortress 2's art style has also began to deteriorate. Not only had shaders been downgraded and animations gutted to save RAM, but the number of cosmetics in the game meant that new ones had to find new territory to reach out to. A vintage firefighter's helmet for Pyro? Sensible. Jester's cap? A bit odd, but that's fine, you know. Track pants? Yep, nope, okay, nope, nah, that's a... That's a little too far. Actually, fun fact, these were given to every class as a joke. Valve had a nasty habit of just accepting every one of the community items updates, so the item developer built a mesh for them for every class, and Valve just said like, yeah, sure, let's throw it in. Additionally, unusuals, a little particle effects around hats, they got increasingly out of hand too. Until you could just run around with a gun that's on fire, dancing to Taipar's Aerobics World Championships 1988 while being struck by lightning because, I don't know. I've lost control of my life. Sure, Team Fortress 2 is still a powerhouse. It's the 13th most played game on Steam right now as I wrote this with 50,545 players at once. But to put that in perspective, TF2 was once Steam's most popular title. Payday 2, a game I love but must admit is plagued with glitches and less than ethical business practices from piecemeal DLC to whatever the black market update tried to accomplish, has more players and is guaranteed to be heading out the door. But TF2 isn't TF2 anymore. I mean, let's look at this last major update, Jungle Inferno. It added five new weapons, the first time the game got new guns in years. But did it? Two new pyro secondaries, the Thermal Thruster Jetpack and the Gas Passer Jerry Can, barely see use to their situational abilities and lackluster control scheme in the Jetpack's case. The Dragon's Fury Flamethrower turns the pyro into a ranged fireball launcher, not unlike Doom's imps, but it's hard to aim due to the awkward angle they hold it at and the mediocre range. The Hot Hand is straight up a joke weapon, and Heavy's single new item is a banana that functions as a direct downgrade to the Sandwich. And while it's been five months since this update, I have to assert right now that this was TF2's first major update since December of 2016. In all of 2017, TF2 had just two major updates. One of them their annual Christmas event, no Halloween event, no sexy celebration, just this and a small handful of holiday exclusive tat. In a more sorry state, it's probably the Team Fortress comic. In the August of 2013, Valve started a seven issue comic concerning the world of TF2. It was mentioned that these comics would be released bi-monthly. The fourth of these comics came out in December 2014, a fifth in August of 2015, ten months later, and the sixth issue launching the following January. Wait, hold on, that's not right. Oh, I meant the following, following January, some 17 months later? Mind you, all seven issues are supposed to be released within the span of 14 months, according to the original deadline. The icing on the cake is that the writers of the TF comic, 
Jay Pinkerton and Eric Wolpaul left Valve during the creation of the comic. Wolpaul in February 2017 and Pinkerton that June. So what will happen to the comic? Did they write the last issue before they left? And drawing it has just taken a long time? Has it gone unwritten? Are new writers being hired? Is it cancelled? We don't know. We might not ever know. It might not ever get finished. Because the comic is free and Valve's been trying to turn money their way for years with Team Fortress 2. In the end, it's pretty fitting to say that the real TF2 killer... was TF2. Valve's apathy when proper competition for the game arrived sealed TF2's fate in one way or another. The buggy matchmaking and game experience as a whole in an era when the game was struggling to stay relevant against Overwatch did not help to keep players around, and even the promotional materials Valve were working on were thrown on hold for months at a time. Once the cards were on the table, the writing was on the wall that TF2 would never be a CSGO, a Dota, an Overwatch. Valve kind of turned their back on the community. And I've got to say right now, this is not to discredit Overwatch or TF2 in any way. Overwatch is mostly a fine game, and TF2 is still enjoyable. I had a fun time recording this, but it's been buried. Under a ton of cosmetics and style clashing bits and bobs, under a dozen other games fighting to take its place, under the crumbling internal infrastructure of Valve software, under its own code. TF2 is still fun, all things considered, but its age is showing, there's cracks in the facade, and we've gotten to see the end result of a decade of corporate discourse, the rise and fall of an intellectual property at one point thought invincible. Again, TF2 still has tons of players, but it's become clear as of late that Valve is apathetic about the situation. To them, TF2 had its moment in the spotlight, but it's time to pack it up and find a new horizon. And that's just sad to admit, this game was a huge part of my life in high school. When a friend of mine dropped out of school due to social pressure and took to homeschooling and online courses instead, TF2 was how we spent our weekends. TF2 helped me make friends. I would not be where I am without TF2. I wouldn't be here without TF2. So many people would not be where they are without TF2. It's I mean, Most of the Hatton Times development team were map makers and community cosmetic contributors for Team Fortress 2. It's sad to see just how it's fallen. And it didn't have to do anything to fall so far. This game had light, it had a liveliness to it, it had ambition and charm and we loved it. Those days are gone. TF2 is an autonomous machine that spits out a case of 16 loosely themed cosmetic items at a time every 3 or 4 months, and sometimes some programmer at Valve digs up the source code and adds a bit to it, but the content patches it gets are not the size, scope, or quality of those in the past. There are no game-changing moments for TF2 anymore, and it's a shame. It's an utter shame. My final verdict for TF2 is that it still exists. It's still fun. It still has so much potential. But Valve's been slow and shy about updating the game. And I guess you really can't blame them once you look at the numbers. But I and a lot of the community would kill for TF2 to get more updates, more regular updates, see the charm and the spirit of the developers return, the charm and the spirits of the community to shine anew once again. Sure, we lost a lot of friends and members along the way, but TF2 was there for me when I started my Steam account, and I wouldn't want anything more than for TF2 to be there for the next person who starts a Steam account. The Uber update brought TF2 back from the brink once. A big update could do it again. I still have faith in the game. I just need to find faith with Valve. But, like, okay, no. Why are the sweatpants equipable on Pyro, though? Hey, that was a slightly sadder video than usual. <laughs> um, we got something fun coming, uh, this Thursday. So, check out Patreon and social media links in the description, and I will, till next time, see you around.